I'm very glad to welcome on the second guest in the series of Liberty Blue Conversations to discuss the Pittsburgh Penguins. I welcome on Danny Shirey of DKPGH Sports. How are we doing today, bud? I'm doing great. Uh, we've got a lot of hockey here on tap through the rest of the regular season. I'm excited to see how it all plays out and uh, heading into the uh, into the big dance. It's been a real grind. I don't know why it feels like, especially in the Eastern Conference, the last couple of years, it's kind of shaken out that way because it kind of feels like the playoff teams more or less get locked in by January or so. But it's been different this year. This has been the most like turbulent Penguins regular season in a long time, like dating back to like Crosby getting hurt and missing like significant stretches of the regular season. What was kind of the driving force in those weird spells of like early December, early January, where we were all kind of looking at each other like, are the Penguins? going to miss the playoffs uh you know i i think it's a number of of factors here um i i think it a lot of it does boil down to and there's probably some some penguins fans that don't want to hear it but the penguins are the league's oldest team right and there's a lot of guys in there that have played a lot of hockey there's a lot of guys that have played a lot of playoff hockey right so i don't necessarily blame them for struggling to get up for a random january midweek January game against the senators, for instance. Um, but it, at the same time, like they they're not as good as they've been in the past from top to bottom. So they they needed to be seeing more and getting more out of some of their depth guys. It just it wasn't really coming along. And obviously, you know, when you have Crosby, Malk and Latang, you <laughs> they're going to do a lot of the legwork for you and, and posturing the team to get into the postseason. Um, but when they were going through those those runs where they, you know, one one night, even for in from game to game, period to period, you'd be like, wow, these guys look like world beaters. And then all of a sudden they are, their controllers are disconnected. And then you're like, well, I've, what is this team? Right. So I, I think it was a number of factors. Things have really started to come together for them lately. They're seven, one and one in their last nine. Um, I, I still struggle to see them being, you know, a, a team that could really go toe to toe with Boston, for instance. But I, I think their outlook right now is, is definitely a little better than I would have said it was a month and a half ago. Do you think there's real legs to the growing sentiment that there was addition by subtraction in getting rid of the guys they were able to with the deadline or has Granlin, Kulikov, I know he's hurt right now. Have the additions made more of a difference than people maybe would think? Uh, I, I don't know that any of the guys they brought in have been that much of a difference yet. Like Nick Benino, he only played a handful of games and then he, he suffered a lacerated kidney and now he's out and it's probably going to be out until the postseason. Um, but get, getting moving on from especially a guy like Brock McGinn, who was making 2.7 my seven five million a season for this season another two seasons after this one when he was going 25 games without a point and he wasn't a guy who was pushing play or anything like that or, or driving play he was a kind of like a defensive specialist who wasn't even anything special on the penalty kill so I, I thought it was great that they were able to get out from under his contract and a guy like Kasperi Kapanen uh, I he was a bit of an interesting case because I think that he's the kind of guy that you can you can have on your third line with the right line mates and the right deployment. He puts up points at a decent rate, but like McGinn, he's not really much of a play driver. Um, he doesn't really help you create many chances other than the opportunistic ones that he capitalizes on, and he obviously is nothing special defensively. So when he's going out there every night with Jeff Carter, who's been one of the worst skaters in the league this season, I, I just – didn't really see any avenue where he was really going to be helping the team aside from the the production he was putting up. Um, and, and like McGinn, I, th I thought it was good that they did get out from under his 3.2 million cap hit for next season as well. I, I honestly was surprised that he did get claimed off waivers. I didn't think there were many teams around the league um, that would take a flyer on him. As for the other acquisitions, Dmitry Kulikov, I, I like him. I think he's fine, um, but they've been playing him on a on a pairing with Jan Ruda, who's another stay at home, big lumbering like defensive defenseman, and they haven't had very good results together. Um, and now Kulikov's out week to week. So the only other acquisition that they brought in that's still playing right now is Mikhail Granlund. He is an upgrade, I think, um, for their third line. But at the same time, if you look at his statistical profile this season and over the past couple seasons, it has not been very pretty. I think he is a better player than that shows. But some of the issues within that profile, such as his defensive play and despite his nifty passing ability that he possesses, it hasn't been 
turning into a whole lot of chances. And that was when he was with the Predators and we're already starting to see that a bit with the Penguins. So I, I, I like him. Um, I just I struggle to see why when all this cap space came out of virtually nowhere that it was just immediately thrown at him. I felt that they could have gone out and, and gotten a, a better player or at least bank those savings going into the off season for a better player, but they made their bed with it. What do you make of Sid and Gino having such good seasons in their mid thirties? Like I was going through and doing show prep and like, they're having their best season since like Obama was president in terms of the underlying numbers, anything drastically different, just being healthy, anything jump out to you? Yeah, the, the health is huge. Like neither of those guys have have missed a game this season, which then you look and it's like, well, neither of those guys have missed a game this season. Those guys are having incredible seasons for their standards, let alone the age that they're at. And the Penguins are still in the position that they're in. So that kind of just speaks to the overall roster construction that they went into this season with. But um, on, on top of being healthy, like I, I'm sure everybody's probably tired of hearing it, but those guys are like two of the most driven guys around the sport. Uh, Crosby, like his his appetite for winning and, and just grinding away really seeps down throughout the entire team and the organization. And, um, you know, he he's obviously doesn't have the physical skills that he once had. You, you go back and look at 18 year old Crosby flying up and down the ice and you almost are like, whoa, like I knew he was great, but that's just incredible. But he's he's really molded and adapted his game to to stay at this elite level. So late into his career, even though the game is really shifting more to Towards skill and speed and Malkin's one of those guys that even though his physical skills might not be there even where they were you know four or five years ago he's now a, a year and a half out from a, a major knee surgery and he's really been feeling it as well um, and and another thing it's part of what drive what he drives people crazy about, but he still, even at this stage, he would rather keep the puck on his stick than relinquish possession of it. And time and time again, if, if you watch any Penguins games or just run through his shifts, you'll go out there. And if he doesn't have an, an avenue to enter the zone, he'll double back and, and hang on to the puck. And that's very valuable, especially toward the top of the lineup. So I think all of those factors have kind of played into both of them uh, having the strong seasons that they've had to this point. Okay, so the big elephant in the room with the Penguins is what exactly Fenway Sports Group's kind of expectations and presence is around the team. Because they had a very weird deadline, like you said, adding Granlund and a bunch of smaller guys. And everybody's kind of curious to see, like, what's the expectation here going forward? Because if that group is only content with just making the playoffs, it makes sense why they had a minimal deadline and that kind of thing. Whereas if they're a little more aggressive, maybe there is a real conversation about, okay, we need to change the GM. This is unacceptable. What's the kind of energy surrounding such uncertainty about the direction of the team going forward? So what I do know is that when Fenway took over the Penguins and bought the Penguins, um, they told Ron Hextall that, well, Sidney Crosby is around. And, and this was before Malkin and, and Latang were re-signed last offseason. But they said, if, if Sidney Crosby is still here, if he's still around, we are going to try and compete for a Stanley Cup. That, that was the goal and the expectation set when Hextall mm. came in. Now, with that being said, me or anyone else involved with the Penguins media, and I've even spoken to members within the organization that just have absolutely no clue where Fenway is. Now, that, that's not saying that they're not involved, but if they are, there's just very, very little um, evidence that they are. And I, I know they were kind of going through the the whole deal with uh, the – I, I think they were looking into selling Liverpool, the, the football yeah. club overseas. And I'm not sure how much that had to do with any of it or if it didn't have anything to do with it. But it, it's been very bizarre to see the lack of presence from Fenway um, just in the public eye. But even on the inside, like nobody really knows what's going on. So I, I wish I had more to give you there, but that, that's about all I've got. Yeah, no, because, I mean, in mid-February, the Penguins weren't in a playoff spot. I want to say it was like the four, right around Valentine's Day or so. They were, I think, a couple points back of that second wild card. And everyone's like, oh, this is what Hextall is going to add. And he's got to go. And suddenly they've kind of just turned it on. I, I feel like that's giving a little too much credit because, like, there's a talented team here. And they did get rid of some dead weight. But anything jump out about the last two, three weeks in particular that's fueled this heater they're on? 
Um, I don't know if it's any one thing. I think when they were dealing with some of the inconsistencies they had earlier in the year, uh, they, they weren't just really, they weren't really working as a five man unit. And I, apologies for using a, the hockey cliche, but when, when they're clicking, there's, there's a connection and, a um, you can just see how in sync they are. And it's, it's a really stark contrast from when they're not playing well. So I, I think it's just the attention to details and the actual, the actual commitment to playing that team game and playing the proper way. Mike Sullivan talks about playing the game the right way all the time. He talks about doing the little things right and not beating yourselves. And time and time again, we've seen the season, the Penguins are um, toward the top of the league and in, in blown leads, um, taking a lead into the third period. And they've lost a considerable number of those games as well. So I, I think the biggest thing is that they just haven't been beating themselves. And that, that goes from managing the puck, um, you know, Mike Sullivan loves when when his guys are he, he obviously wants them to flex their skill when the opportunity presents itself. But he knows that the opportunity isn't always going to present itself. And he wants his guys getting into foot races and putting pucks behind other teams defensemen. And when they aren't doing that and just try and skill or will their way to victory, they end up getting in trouble. And I haven't seen a whole lot of that from them lately. What would you describe the Penguins' style of play as? Like, when they're rolling right, what what are the key indicators that things are going right for them in terms of how they want to play? The thing that I always I always look for, especially at the start of games, is how well they're forechecking because they have not been a very good defensive team this year, and a big reason for that is because their transition defense has just been absolutely, like, abominable at times. That is a culmination of not – doing the proper things that they need to be doing on the four check further up ice when they are pressing in the offensive zone. Um, it, it's really kind of funny. Like you can look and you can directly tie a lot of the goals they give up um, where up the ice on the four check, the, the F one or the F two just kind of peeled off pressure too soon, or they weren't good enough on the back check or whatever. Um, so th that all kind of ties into it, but you know, I, I struggle to say that they're the the speed team that they were in 2016, 17. They'll they'll still tell you that they try and play the same way, but you look at the personnel they have, they're that it's it's not the same team. So I, I struggle to say that they're a, a full speed skill team. Um, I, I think when they are at their best, they're they're very calculated, they're very tactical. And you can kind of see that when they're breaking down defensive coverage with their crisp passing and they're finding those, those good lanes. So I, I don't know that I have like a, a perfect synopsis for their playing style, but when they are on they're they're very tactical. Okay. One last question before we transition towards Rangers penguins, what is it about the Islanders that gives the penguins fits? Because this is a historical thing that pre that's multiple Islander coaches, different personnel on both teams. It does any, what about the Islanders gives the penguins such a hard time? Uh, one, I, I think there is the factor of just variance. Like hockey is yeah. just so susceptible to, to giant swings and, and stuff that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but, and, and the penguins won't tell you this, but I, I have to have to imagine that there is like some mental factor there. Yeah. Right. And that, that's dating back to the, even the postseason series that they played several years ago where, uh, the, the penguins probably could have won that series. But like I was talking about earlier, they just found ways to beat themselves, uh, namely Tristan Jari gifting a goal to uh, I forget which player it was. It might've been Josh Bailey, but it, it was an overtime game. The Penguins like needed to win the game and he just turned the puck over right up the middle of the ice with no defense back. Um, and, and that's, that's like the kind of mental errors that we've seen from the Penguins when they go up against the Islanders. And the, the funny thing about it is that um, the past three games they've played the Islanders, they've dominated, like absolutely yeah. dominated them for 50, 55 minutes. And then they've got a five, 10 minute stretch where the wheels just utterly fall off. And, and a lot of those issues that I previously mentioned just reared their head. So um, the, the Islanders are, are in their head for sure. <laughs> So it's transitioning now, but the Rangers and Penguins, when the goal tent, when the Penguins have had reasonable goaltending, the games have essentially come down to coin flips. The one that sticks out to me was the game last season where it was zero, zero for 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Kreider took an offensive zone penalty. And then the Penguins scored one, nothing. Then there was the game after the deadline where Yari didn't play because he was hurt. 
the Rangers ran them out of the building. And then they played one of the last games of the season where neither team was really playing anybody because it didn't matter at that point. They knew they were playing each other. What about the Rangers Penguins kind of, why is there all of this? I don't want to say animosity because it's hockey. There's obviously tension going on, but what is it about when these two teams play that the wheels kind of come off and you get things like Sunday where the entire game, everybody kind of, you feel the vibe getting a little more hairy and hairy. The referees are letting guys go. There were so many uncalled penalties in that game. What, when these two teams meet, kind of brings that out? Because the Penguins aren't like a nasty team, and neither are the Rangers. That's what's so weird about it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that can just be tied to what went down in the in that postseason series that yeah. they played last spring. I mean, um, I, I know the Penguins weren't happy um, with Truba taking Crosby out. I know they weren't happy with Lindgren taking Raquel out of that series, and, and we can sit here and go back and forth all day on those individual hits. But regardless, I, I think that's where a lot of this comes from. Um, we even saw that a little bit. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what month it was, but there was, I, it might've been the last time the Rangers played in Pittsburgh this regular season. There was a little bit of that animosity as well. Yeah. Brian Russ scored a goal and he might've been getting into it with like Truba or Lindgren or, or somebody out there. And Rust ended up scoring a goal and he like went and like kind of motioned toward whoever he was beefing with and like Kapanen was still on the team at the time. And he had to like come and like bear hug him from behind to like prevent him from going after the guy. Um, so uh, these guys don't like each other from, from that post season series and uh the the first time the two teams played earlier this year some of the penguins players were asked about it and of course they're like yeah it's a new season it's a new team but some of the guys on both sides that are still around from that postseason series i still think they're carrying a little bit of that with them from your ten thousand foot view on the outside what are your impressions of the rangers um probably i think i'm a little higher on them than i was last season um from a from a skater standpoint um because last year i mean i i don't i don't think i'm stepping out of line here by saying it, that was the Shesterkin show last year, right? Like the, the Rangers, if they were getting the same level of goal t- or just league average goaltending, like they, they'd probably would have been in the position that the Penguins are in right now this season. Um, so I, the thing about the Rangers is I, I don't love – Uh, the system that Gallant runs, but I have to give them credit. And I don't know if this is something that just rears its head against the Penguins more than it does other teams, but the Rangers, their ability to counterattack and and score in quick strike fashion is just unbelievable to me. And that that even goes back to last postseason, like the Penguins would spend seemingly an entire period in the Rangers end. And then all of a sudden Kreider and Zibanejad are going on a two on one the other way. And it's a tie game. Right. So I I'm really impressed. And I, I do think there's something to be said for teams that play that way, because it's like, no matter how we're playing, we just need that one or two opportunities that come along to keep it, to, to keep ourselves in the game and give ourselves a shot at winning. And obviously I, I know Igor hasn't been as great as he was uh, last season, but when you got him between the pipes, it's, it's hard not to like your chances when you have that build, that ability to score in quick fashion, even if you aren't playing well and you know that you have that rocket goal. You mentioned before that when the Penguins are going right, their forecheck is really going. And that really jumped out to me on Sundays that the Rangers just could not exit the zone. And I know during the playoffs last year that the Rangers got out really fast in that first game. It was 3-1, 10 minutes into the game. And then the Penguins chipped away, chipped away. And something I noticed that the Penguins did was they saw the Rangers were looking for that quick first pass out of the zone. So they started playing tighter up in the neutral zone. So that stretch pass wasn't there. And then the Rangers just couldn't do anything because of that forecheck. So one of the things I'll be looking for going forward Thursday and Saturday, especially is can somebody other than fat Adam Fox exit the zone cleanly? Cause he's the only guy they have who can do it with any real regularity. Yeah. It, it kind of stuck out to me in the most recent game as well. Like the, even when the Rangers were in the offensive zone, like some, I don't know if it was because of the Penguins pressure or if it was just maybe a little bit of an off night for them, but it seemed like they I don't even want to say it was careless with the puck. So maybe it was the Penguins pressure, but I, I, it kind of stood out to me a little bit that their, their passes were a little off the mark. They were putting pucks in positions that you were at least. And obviously those guys are out down on the ice and and seeing different things. And we're seeing from up top, but there there were definitely a few times where I was a little curious as, as to what their, their end game was with, with, just some of the routes that they were taking and, and some of where they were putting some of those pucks. Um, so 
I don't know what that really ties into. And obviously we see giant swings um, in performance just from game to game because of so many different factors. Um, but I, I definitely think that'll be something to keep an eye on. What's your outlook rest of the season for the Penguins? Their schedule's reasonable. Is it one of the wild cards? Any shot at that third spot in the division? I mean, they're, I think, two back of the, four back of the Rangers, something like that, going into their game today? Yeah, I I don't know. I they they can make a push for for the third spot if if they take a couple of they they honestly need to beat the Rangers in, in regulation in both those games if they want to have a leg, legitimate shot of of taking that third spot, but I I'm probably going to pencil them in for one of those wild card spots right now. Um every Everything I know about this team and, and have seen from them this season tells me that they're on their way to another first round exit. Uh, but just because it's hockey and just because hockey is so goofy, so random all the time, it wouldn't shock me at all if the the – I don't want to call this a bad team because they're not a bad team, but just the worst team that the Penguins have had over this last five-year stretch or, or whatever it may be, it would not shock me at all if somehow the worst team that they had over that stretch somehow ends up winning a postseason round. Now, as far as making a run for the Stanley Cup, I, I really struggle to see that happening just because, you know, up until this this current stretch that they're on right now, like the 7-1-1 one, and one stretch, is one of the best stretches they've gone on all season. And I, I'm not in really in the business of being like, Oh, well, those wins are actually weren't that great. Cause they were against, you know, weaker opponents, but it, it, it's fair to at least point out that a lot of these wins were against the blue jackets, the flyers um, and teams like that. I don't know that they're going to be able to, to knock off the Bruins or, or even the hurricanes or something like that. It would be, and I don't, I don't know that it could play out this way, but I would love to see another series between the Penguins and Rangers. The only world in which that happens yeah. would require, it would require one of the devils or Carolina really hitting a skid. So the Rangers could go up to two because they're like 10 back of de the devils right now, which is kind of ridiculous considering right. they were like, four points back a month ago. The Rangers, February was not very kind to them. Between dressing 16 guys for multiple games, only having four defensemen for one of them, it's been a really rough month. I mean, they they have one regulation win in a month. That It's been tough sledding since the kind of the Kane stuff kind of intensified that third week of February where everybody, where it kind of came clear that it was going to happen. It's been, it's been a really weird month for the Rangers. Yeah, it, I was going to ask you, like, what have been your impressions of, of Kane? Because I, I was not all that impressed from what I saw in, in the game against the Penguins here. The only thing that's really jumped out to me is he still got the transition stuff. He still enters the zone pretty cleanly. He can make zone exits by himself. But he still has no idea where he needs to be in the offensive zone. He has skated into Panarin two or three times while Panarin has the puck on the cycle because he just has no idea where he needs to be. It, it's clear he's kind of overthinking things. There was the play against Montreal last week where he just like lost the puck stick handling and Montreal came down and short, scored a shorthanded goal. He's trying to find his spot, but he's not the fast guy he was anymore, which is the kind of the biggest thing of watching him game to game now versus, you know, five, six years ago is he just doesn't have the straight line speed. He's got to try and outthink everybody and his hands are still there. He's still got a decent shot, but he's not going to be able to drive play. He's a passenger. He's riding shotgun. Panarin's going to generate the vast majority of the zone entries. The biggest thing is they keep playing buddy ball. They ref neither of them wants to shoot. They just pass to each other in the offensive zone, and nobody ever wants to shoot. Like, they've had decent looks, but they just continue to pass out of real opportunities. And they have Trocek in the middle of them, who's not a finisher. Uh, Trocek's a good player, but he's got 19 goals by going to the net and putting his head down. He doesn't have them from shooting from 20, 30 feet out. So I think the Rangers may have kind of overplayed their hand on the – finesse skill guys in the sense that they all do the same thing like even Zabinijad who's their leading goal scorer this year he doesn't shoot enough if he shot more he would be closer to 40 goals <laughs> they excuse me they have a bunch of pass first guys and nobody ever wants to shoot yeah that that was going to be my next question is like like obviously it's it's kind of hard to turn down the opportunity of bringing Patrick Kane in but at the same time I was going to ask you is like kind of I want to need a rider Niederreiter would have been uh, my pluggy type don't, guy. I don't wanted. get me, don't get me started on Niederreiter. Okay, so he he the the Predators took a second round pick for Niederreiter several days before the deadline. The Penguins then went and 
gave Nashville a second round pick for Granlund, who costs a million more against the salary cap than than Niederreiter does. He's older than Niederreiter does and has two more years of term than Niederreiter does. So if you want to get me going on Nino Niederreiter, we can absolutely do that. That's the type of skill set the Rangers need. They have too many guys who play the exact same way. And the Rangers can only really win one, two ways. They can either do the goalie thing, which, you know, that works when he's on, but he hasn't been on this year. And occasionally when they play teams that are sloppy in transition and they can jump on them with speed through the neutral zone and get those odd man rushes, those rush opportunities, those are really the only two formulas. Against tightly structured teams, those cross-team passes aren't there. And the Rangers don't forecheck that well. They don't have a lot of guys who can win those puck battles down low that's the other thing I don't think Kane has won a single loose puck since he's gotten here I know that's not his game but he's just shown a total unwillingness to get into puck battles of any kind in any situation and that was kind of the issue I had with acquiring Mikhail Granlund as well on yeah. the Penguins side is like even if this statistical profile that we've got two years of evidence showing that, you know, he's not all that great of a player. Even if you find some middle ground between that and the player that he used to be back when he was with Minnesota, you look at the things that he does well and the things that he doesn't do well. What he does do well is, is passing the puck and his vision. Well, the, the, the Penguins have plenty of those guys, right? They don't yeah. need. And, and like I was talking about earlier, when they kind of get themselves into trouble, they'll try and skill or, or will their way to victory. They don't need more guys that are that are going to look for that next pass rather than putting a puck on goal. They needed a guy like Nieder, Niederreiter who could go in and, and win puck battles for him, be aggressive on the forecheck, kind of a, establish a presence around the net front. Not a guy like Granlund who is is a little guy. They have him lift, listed at like 5'11". I'd be shocked if he's actually taller than like 5'9 and a half, which is whatever. Like you, you can have those kinds of players, but I just – I, I wrote about it the night that they traded for him. I was like, look, even even if you believe that this player is a lot better than it seems on the outside, I don't see him addressing the Penguins needs whatsoever. So two last things before I get you out of here. Number one, the Penguins have been linked to a lot of the bigger name guys, which is why I had heard they were really looking at Besser. They were really looking at JT Miller. Any inclination as to why they opted to go on the smaller end of the market as opposed to one of those bigger guys, considering how they made $5 million of cap space appear out of nowhere that they could have added somebody a little more high end? So the one thing I will say about some of those rumors, and I'm not denying the rumors you brought up, but yeah. I, 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 I have got a pretty – I've got a couple of different – things that I've heard that lead me to believe that Hextall was straight up giving false information to members of his front office to try and figure out who was leaking information mm -hmm. because there was a point in time where people within the organization and, and everyone I've talked to loves working for Ron Hextall says he's a great boss, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with his actual job title as general manager and the guy who's putting this team together. Um, so I, I think there was a little bit of, of smoke and mirrors there with uh, some of the rumors, but I, I'm almost led to believe there's no like greater plan here that Hextall mm -hmm. has, right? Like Granlin came out of nowhere. They said that um, both him and Brian Burke said that they have uh, tried acquiring him at each of the past couple of deadlines. So he was obviously on their radar, but it, it almost seemed like, okay, Jacob Chikrin's off the board. Like we just got to go do something now. Right. Because Mike Sullivan wanted Hextall to go out and get Chikrin. Hextall didn't want to pay the price for it. And obviously, I know the Coyotes were a little bit concerned about the the selection spot of the first round pick or picks that they were going to be bringing in for him. And obviously, the Penguins is, is probably going to end up being a mid to late round first round pick that they would have had to offer. Um, but it, it really just seemed to me like, OK, we weren't able to get Chikrin. Some of the other big names are off the board um, and doing any kind of deal for a JT Miller type would have involved a third. And I've even heard from some sources that said there might, there would have been a fourth team involved to just try and make all the money work. So that seemed like it was just something that was a little too convoluted and they were like, all right, well, we couldn't get the big fish. We might as well just go and get somebody. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Last question for you. They, the Penguins haven't won a playoff series in a number of years. How much of that would you attribute to them just re-rolling the same goaltending tandem for a while now? I I don't know. Like, obviously, 
Jari, Jari basically lost them that series against the Islanders a couple years ago. And then the absence of him and DeSmith last postseason obviously, obviously yeah. hurt them. I, I just don't know what else they could have done. Like DeSmith this season has been wildly inconsistent, and but the Penguins also play a much worse brand of hockey in front of him compared to when they're playing in front of Jari. Now that might have some merit just because Jari is the better goalie and they feel a little bit more confident out there and, and don't have to worry about giving up um, as many shots or high danger chances because they know they've got their number one back there. Uh, but the this, this Smith, if you if you look at his numbers, there's no quantifiable evidence that says he's some sort of goalie that's a terrible backup or shouldn't be in the league. If you look, he's actually pretty decent backup compared to what some of these other teams are trotting out there. And he comes in at a pretty decent cap hit. So I, I've seen a lot of people involved with the Penguins and just among the fan base that were like, I can't believe they brought this goaltending duo back. I can't believe they didn't make any changes. But being up against the salary cap, I just don't know what else they could have done. Because if they were going to go out and get a different backup, they would have been paying him more than DeSmith. And I'm not convinced that that backup would have even been better than him. And they're still not paying Tristan Jari all that much right now. He's he's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the summer, but his cap hit is phenomenal for what they've gotten from him for the past two seasons. So anywhere they would have looked to make changes, I think would have just been a further detriment to the to the lineup in front of them, which as mentioned has already been pretty inconsistent this season. Something I just thought of because we're on the subject of goaltending. What do you make of how Jim Rutherford's operated in Vancouver? Because the Penguins, he's got a very interesting reputation amongst the hockey men. The hockey men are very big fans of Jim Rutherford. They're very big fans of David Poyle. The guys who do things the right way, quote unquote. What do you make of how Rutherford's kind of operated since leaving Pittsburgh? Because he kind of left the Penguins in the lurch when he resigned the, his job. Yeah, so if, if you talk to most of the people that are currently involved in Penguins media, they have nothing but phenomenal, phenomenal things to say about Rutherford um, because he was extremely accessible. He told you exactly what he was thinking. He told you exactly what his plans were. Um, you know, reporters could reach out to him like on their own and just kind of shoot the crap with them and, and have conversations with him. Well, this is my first full season on the beat. So I, I've only ever been around for the Hextall era. I was never around with the team on the beat for the Rutherford era. So I, I don't, don't have that perception of him and my thoughts and, and feelings toward it is ex exactly centered around his job as general manager. Um, and <laughs> I just think we're seeing a lot of the, I, I'm not trying to, to diminish the work he did to get the Penguins back to back cups in 16 and 17. But if you look at what he did after that, and even before that, and even dating back to his time in Carolina, he seems to be making a lot of the same mistakes that he's made throughout his career. Um, now that he's with the Canucks. So and I know Patrick Alvine is, is the, the official general manager, but it, it seems like those two are, are basically running things in tandem. And I'm not seeing a whole, like, I, I just don't know what their game plan is, is either. It seems extremely reactionary and like they're literally just going about it on a day-to-day -day basis when that team needs some serious, serious changes as it has for quite some time now. Okay, what's the Penguins' goal for the rest of the week with two with the Rangers? Split. Well, uh, they they want to they want to win them all. I I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I'm I'm sure they would be happy to take a split for sure. They've they've got uh, the Canadians coming up tonight as well. Um, that kind of a prototypical trap game, and the, the Canadians seem to give them fits. So I, I guess it might depend on on how that game ends up going. But I I think they'd be happy coming out with a split. Yeah, don't sleep on the Canadians. The Rangers had to go to the shootout against them last Saturday. That was not very inspiring. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Canadians are one of those teams, too, kind of like the Islanders. I, I don't know that there's anything more there, but the Canadians are one of those teams that kind of give have not only this season, but just in the past have given the Penguins some fits. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. Thanks so much for coming by, dude. This is fun. Yeah, thanks a ton for having me. I'd be happy to join you anytime. Definitely, definitely. All right, that will wrap it up for the second of the series of Liberty Blue Conversations. More to come with more sports media people, more to come with Stats Bros. A lot to come. We'll see you guys soon.